literature is about trying to reach for those human truths. Good evening. Well, it's always a delight to be on stage at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, but it's doubly so for me tonight because of the man I'm going to introduce you to. My first of all, thanks to the Royal Bank of Scotland for sponsoring this event in particular and for being such a solid long-term friend to this uh, book festival. With, uh, with friends like the Royal Bank of Scotland, we're able to do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Thanks also to Robert Skinner, who's going to translate everything we say into British Sign Language. Salman Rushdie needs no introduction. He's the author of 14 works of fiction, but he's more recently the author of this book, Languages of Truth, essays written between 2003 and 2020. It's a tremendously good read. You can buy it online if you're watching at home, if you're watching around the world online, or you can buy it here in the bookshop in the uh, fire station after, after the, um, the, the, the event. Please welcome Salman Rushdie. Salman, you reveal at the very end of the book that while you were sitting out the pandemic at home in New York City, you caught COVID-19 at the age of 72 and with a long-standing underlying condition, asthma. It must have been tremendously frightening for you. Well, yeah, it was because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was in, in the middle of March of last year. And, and at that point, none of us, I think, really understood what this thing was. Um, and so it had the fear of the unknown, you know, that it, um, this thing arrived and it changed the lives of everybody in the world literally overnight. Uh, um, and um, I was, I, I guess I ended up being very lucky because um, I didn't have the worst of it. You know, and the, thing, the thing that kept me out of hospital is that I, it, didn't, in the, it didn't affect my breathing. Uh, and my blood oxygen level was okay. I mean, I had, a, I had all the other stuff, you know, I mean, I had, I had high fever and I had a cough and I had aches and pains and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I was able to stay out of hospital. And at that moment, when even doctors didn't know really how to treat this thing, um, people were essentially going to hospital to die. You know? And um, I was fortunate that I had a very, very good doctor. So many of us can say in this last year and a half that we owe an enormous amount to the doctors who treated us or who guided us. And I had a terrific one who, who called me every day and asked me a series of questions about my health. And on the basis of that, basically told me, stay home and tough it out. And that's what I did. You, um, it's quite a short essay at the end of the book about the pandemic. Um, and you talk about... Um, Somebody who we both knew, Susan Sontag, who wrote a, a, a book called Illness as Metaphor after recovering from cancer. Um, and there's been quite a lot of metaphorical thinking uh, during this pandemic as well, which is very, uh, in, in your account of it, very uh, bad thinking. What, what do you mean by that? What is the metaphorical well, I mean, thinking? Well, the great, the great thing about Susan's famous book is that she, she said illness is not a metaphor, illness is an illness. And, and the, in, instead of treating it as a as a sign of doom, or a, you know, or a kind of indication from the gods that we should change our ways, or any of the things that were that were said about about this pandemic and have been said about the plague in the past and so on, that that's just the wrong way to look at it. What you need to look at it as is as, as people being very unwell and needing to be treated and and, and needing to get well. Uh, treat it, treat illness as illness. Um, and uh, I must say, I remember that essay when, well, I remember it very often in the last year and a half, and I think, it, I think it's very wise. I, I was kind of reassured to read your account of it, because last year, during the first lockdown, I kind of beat myself up a bit for not achieving anything particularly creative with all this spare time, but you said something similar happened to you. You found it quite hard to work. The, 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 the sentence, the roar of the real world was deafening and left no quiet space in which an imagined world might grow. And I thought, well, if it happened to Salman Rushdie, I don't feel so bad that I didn't well, achieve anything. You know, I just think that the scale of the tragedy was so great um, that, that um, 
it was very difficult to, to, to say, let me make up a story, you know? Um, and it took me a while, uh, but in the end, I, I did get back to it. And, um, and that, of course, is helped me, helped me to, to get through it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it was overwhelming as an experience for all of us. I mean, I think one of the things I think is we all know this because it happened to every single one of us. You know, um, this feeling of being overwhelmed by uh, this colossal global tragedy. Um, and, and then being in many ways very angry about the way in which it was handled. Uh, uh, and certainly here in the United States, it was, it was handled very, very badly indeed. And it, one of the reasons I wanted to start our conversation with this was that it shone a very unforgiving light on the state of the United States and indeed some of the other democracies that we consider to be secure and entrenched. And one of the, one of the aspects of that that it's highlighted is the, the division into two separate Americas that no longer have a shared public reality. It's not just that they disagree about the available facts, they don't even have shared available facts. That's been, that's been evident in the way the two Americas have responded to this pandemic, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's because, it's because it was politicized, you know, and, and um, which is just an absurd thing, you know, because the pandemic actually, the coronavirus doesn't care how you vote, you know, um, and uh, it doesn't affect your likelihood of getting it or not, depending on whether you're on the left or the right, you know, but but it was heavily politicized. And even right now, in when parts of the United States are doing very well and other parts are doing very badly in their, in their response to the, to, to, the, to, to, to the pandemic, the places which are the kind of Trumpier places of America, in a way, don't want to be vaccinated because they see that as giving in to the liberals. You know, in some way, they would be doing what the hated libs want them to do. Uh, and, um, and, and that's just a, an insane way of looking at uh, a health crisis. You know, but but that's, well, that is where we are. And how has it happened, do you think, that this, these two Americas now gaze each other in mutual incomprehension and indeed rage across an ever-widening gulf? Well, the gulf was there before Trump. But I, one has to say that it was enormously deepened uh, during the years of the Trump administration and, and, and goes on being deepened by large quantities of the Republican Party that won't accept the result of the last election. You know, so, um, which actually any independent observer would say and did say that this was one of the fairest, best scrutinized um, most honest elections ever. And yet, there's a substantial chunk of the United States that believe it was fixed. Um, and that, so the, rea the rift in reality didn't begin with Trump, but it was colossally deepened by him. You, the book is called Languages of Truth, and you talk about different conceptions of truth and how quite often fiction, which declares its fictionality up front, the contract between the fiction writer and the reader is, the fiction writer says, this is a made up story but I depend upon you to suspend your disbelief. And the reader comes in and says, I will suspend my disbelief. I will believe the story, even though you've declared it to be fiction, because I believe I will learn a different kind of truth from it, a truth from untruth. That's, that seems to me very important. It's a theme that runs all the way through this book. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I remember in the early days of the, of the pandemic, I remember, I remember people saying, you know, why at a time when there is such a, when there are so many lies around, you know, why do you want to make things up? You know, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you just adding to the problem, so to speak? Um, and, and I remember, I think Margaret Atwood said something, I'll paraphrase it, but, but what I think she was getting at was that fiction and lies are not the same thing. That, that, um, that literature actually, whatever techniques it uses, whether realistic or fantastic, is trying to tell you some kind of truth about human nature, about the kinds of people that we are and why we do the things we do and why we build the societies we build and what happens to them, what goes wrong and what goes right. Literature is about trying to 
reach for those human truths, you know, um, and and the, the, the techniques, as I say, are, are completely secondary. It doesn't matter whether it's science fiction or fantasy or kitchen sink realism. And they, they, all of that is trying to aim towards the truth, whereas the lie, of course, is a way of obscuring the truth. One of um, the, the, my working life as a, as a foreign correspondent and as a reporter more generally has been dedicated to the conviction, it's been built on the conviction that there's something called the truth and that it's yeah. knowable and verifiable, and that once it's been verified, it can be established to a high degree of satisfactory proof. That idea now, for the first time in living memory, is under very, very serious assault. The idea of evidence, the idea of reasoned argument is now under assault from very, very powerful quarters. Uh, you deal with this in the book. How dangerous is this for uh, the survival of, of something we all took for granted until very recently, which is to say democracy? Well, it's the, it is the crucial thing that needs to happen in order to destroy democracy. Uh, because if there is no longer any consensus, not only about the truth, but about how you arrive at the truth, um, then you allow, it makes it possible for somebody to stand up as dictators often have, uh, and uh, to say, everybody else is lying to you, I am the truth. And, and that moment at which you believe in the individual rather than in, as you say, the processes of the truth, and establishing the truth, evidence, etc. cetera, um, that's the way in which authoritarianism begins. And, and, and here in America on January the 6th of this year, we came within a few millimeters of, uh, of, that, of that assault on democracy succeeding. Um, I mean, I think, you know, because it doesn't, it didn't succeed, and because some of the people involved looked like almost comic grotesque figures, you know, with Viking horns on and so on, um, it, it may be easy for people not to understand how close we came. Um, but this was as close as the, uh, the most powerful democracy in the world uh, came to becoming something else. You know? And so it showed, and, the fragility of the system, and that fragility continues. I was and on I the stage the other day with the, the outgoing New York correspondent of the BBC, a man called Nick Bryant, who's a tremendously good and brave journalist, and I put it to him that the, the institutions of American democracy had done their job, that the American democracy had survived because the institutions were strong. And he said to me, I wish I could be as optimistic as you, because imagine what would have happened if both houses had been controlled by Trump loyalists. So do you, think it, do you think it was very close? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, the, during the election, when the election, or just after the election, when the election was under enormous assault by, by Trump and his cronies, all around America, there were election officers, many of whom were Republicans, uh, some of whom were Trump appointees, who defended the election and, and would not buy into what is now being called the big lie. They, uh, the, the, they, they said, no, this is a fair election. We, I'm standing here with our workers and I, they have done a wonderful job and, I, and this election is credible. And that happened in states from, from, from Arizona to Wisconsin to Georgia to you know, uh, across the country. And those officials saved us because they did not do, they did not go along party lines. They broke with the party line and simply did their job. Now, those officials have since the election been under colossal attack. And, and several of them have, have either willingly or unwillingly given up their positions. And we don't exactly know who's taking their place. And we don't exactly know if what happened this time will happen next time. You know, uh, because the, if the personnel had been different, things would have been very difficult. So yes, the institutions held up, but they only just held. Uh, and with a little, with a few different individuals in different positions, the system could have failed. And, and I think that is something we all have to be very aware of. Uh, the book is very trenchant in its defense of the values that you've been associated with all your writing life. Um, and, but it's also very personal and even intimate in places. And one of the things that struck me very early on in the book is that you, it reminded me of Picasso saying, it's taken me a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. 
you, ha you have a very enduring capacity for wonder, which, which lights up right at the start of this book. Where does that come from? Well, I, th I think it comes from, comes from growing up in India, you know? I mean, I think it comes from, um, or at least it begins there, it comes from growing up in a world where your great gift is this storehouse of, of fantastic tales, you know? Um, some of them epic, uh, some of them animal fables, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of wonderful stories that you first come across in child versions, although many of them were not actually written for children. Uh, I mean, The Thousand and One Nights is not written for children. It's a very adult book. Um, but there are children ver children's versions of it. So you grow up with this, with this, this wonderful environment um, of which teaches you, or taught me anyway, something about the beauty of fictionality, the fact that fiction should actually be fictional, be, be, come from the imagination and not just from observation. Um, and I mean, you need both, but, but, the, but I think the realist tradition uh, privileges observation over imagination. Um, and um, in my view, both those things are essential. So, so it started there. I mean, then, you know, when, I remember when I first came to England and, and was at school, um, I was a huge science fiction addict. Um, and I just read industrial quantities of science fiction. Um, and then at a certain point stopped. But I think it, I think it left its mark. So I just, I think, being in the camp of the writers who believe in the use of imagined, who believe in highly imagined fiction. Um, I have great admiration for the writers of the other kind. You know, I mean, I, I've often felt that if I had had the kind of life of someone like William Faulkner, um, who, had, who was deeply rooted in one little corner of the world and was able to make a lifetime of work out of his knowledge of that little corner. I mean, I have great en kind of envy for that, but, but my life's been somewhat different. And, and so the, the way the books come out is also different. Yeah, so reading this book, is, it, it's a bit like being invited backstage into one of the great creative imaginations of our age. You get to see the anatomy and physiology of Salman Rushdie's imagination. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great experience just immersing yourself in seeing how this imagination works. And one of the things you talk about, Salman, is you say, for me, the fantastic has been a way of adding dimensions to the real. You break down the barrier between the real and the fantastic in order to show us that what we mistakenly view in our lives as ordinary is it can often, in fact, be extraordinary. And you seem to be holding out the, the argument, making the argument that fiction has a kind of, not just a transformative power, but even offers transcendence in some way, enables us to become someone else almost for the, while we're reading. Well, I think one of the things I do think is, is true. Yes, I think it allows us to enter into the, the, the interiority of people who are not like ourselves. And I, and, and, and I think that's enormously valuable. And in, in this age when I think we live in an age of great translators, you know, and, and, um, and as a result, we have available to us not just the world of our own language, but, but the world of, of a world of languages. And I, I've always been very found great inspiration in, in, in works that I've only read in translation, you know, books that I've read in, books which were written in, in Spanish or Russian or Japanese or, um, or whatever it may be, you know, and, and, and I think that's a great gift that literature gives us. It gives us the world. It gives us the, the inner reality. You know, you, you look at, I mean, you look at Afghanistan on the news and you, you see what the news has to show you. You see, you see explosions and horror. Um, if, you, if you read the literature about Afghanistan, you, you begin to have some sense of the lived experience of what it's like to be there, be a person there, be, be a person from there. And, and literature can give us that, you know, and that's, that's a colossal gift. Uh, you've got a knocker on the door of your study in the shape of Shakespeare's head, Shakespeare's face, and then you say, uh, William, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare is the owner of the domain to which the knock admits me. Wh why do you, wh what do you think you owe to, what do you think we all owe to William Shakespeare? Well, 
All right, how long have you got? <laughs> yes. um, well, one thing I think is that the, the classical tradition in English is different from that in, for example, French. Now, in, in, if you look at the classics in French, if you look at you know, Racine, Corneille, Moliere, etc., one of the things they say is that a, a work of art can only be one thing. You know, a tragedy can't be a comedy, um, but, and vice versa. Um, what Shakespeare does is to show us that, that everything can be everything at once. You know, so, I mean, I used it somewhere in the book the example of, uh, of Hamlet, you know, that uh, uh, act one, scene one is a ghost story. Um, and it progresses from being a ghost story to being a, a political story about intrigues at the court of Denmark, uh, to being a love story, to having comic scenes and going to being a revenge tragedy uh, and goes back to being a love story at certain points and back to being a ghost story at other points. You know? and, and what Shakespeare makes possible is for us to imagine that all those different things can cohere into a single whole. You know, in other words, that the book can, the book or the play can contain like a multitude. And, and that, that's an enormous gift, I think, to allow us to think like that. You spent the first 14 years of your life in India, and then you came to Great Britain as a 14-year-old schoolboy. So the migrant's experience has been the, has been the, uh, the backdrop to your creative work. Uh, to some extent, we live in the age of migration. How, how do you, th I mean, it's a huge question and, and you could probably talk for a day on it, but how do you think in a nutshell, the, mi the migration experience has shaped the writer you are? Well, I think it, 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 it's everything, you know, it's, 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 an, it's entirely at the heart of the writer that I am because it's, it's first of all, not just enabled me, but obliged me to consider how the world joins up, you know, how, how the world over here connects to the world over there and that we don't any longer live in separate little boxes, that all our boxes flow in, open up into each other's boxes. And the act of journeying across the world and living in different parts of it, um, first of all, gives you some insight into that. And secondly, obliges you to, to talk about it. And, and I think, you know, to live in one of the great cities of the world now, whether it's, you know, whether it's Bombay or London or New York, is to see the consequences of migration because these cities are created by the phenomenon of migration. You know, you, you walk down the streets of Manhattan and you hear every language in the world. You know, you hear, you hear um, people talking about histories from literally, every, you get into a taxi and you hear about, I don't know, Azerbaijan, you know, um, and, so that plurality of experience, that plural society is the creation of this, as you, what you and I've also called it, the age of migration. Um, of course, there's, we now live in a time in which there's been a degree of suspicion about migration, you know, and, and hostility towards it. And, and I feel the need to speak back against that. And one of the things that actually really pleased me was to read when I learned that the two scientists in Germany who developed the Pfizer vaccine um, were Turkish immigrants, husband and wife team of Turkish immigrants. So, at at, you know, Turk Germany has had its issues about Turkish immigrants. Um, and it's, it is kind of rather beautiful that this community, which is sometimes treated badly, you know, um, has produced the husband and wife team who have, to put it simply, saved the world. But, um, but you, say, you, you, you say that you, you've always envied writers like Eudora Welty and William Faulkner for the depth of their roots because they can spin an entire life's canon out of a single rooted place and your experience is the opposite of that. Uh, and because one of, the things, one of the points you make is that if you're a migrant, you don't know what ground you're standing on until you invent it. And yeah. migrants are required not just to self-interrogate but to self-curate to some extent. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I remember um, V.S. Naipaul's novel, The Enigma of Arrival, uh, talks about that. It talks about the phenomenon of arriving, you know, and, and, uh, and when you arrive, you don't, literally, you don't know the ground you stand on. You don't, you don't understand where you stand in the society, you know. Um, 
migration often rips up all the roots of the self. You know, the self is, is rooted in, for example, the language that we speak or the belief system that we have or the community that we are familiar with, etc. You know, and migration gets rid of all of that. And suddenly you have to start again. Um, you have to decide what to absorb from the world in which to, to, it, to which you've come, what to retain from the world that you came from, uh, you have to, you know, what do you discard? What do you, what do you assimilate? Um, how, how are you to be in this new, in this new world? You know, it used to be, in America, you know, in, in an earlier time, that people migrating from Eastern Europe would say to their children, "Don't speak the old language. Speak English." You know, uh, uh, they, would, they would, they would try and make themselves new people in the new country. Um, now there's a somewhat different attitude where, where, where migrant communities, I, to my mind, quite rightly, want to insist on their, their identities. You know? um, but it's a question. And that question, of course, is, a, is an existential question that whether you're a migrant or not applies to you. How do you see yourself? How do you tell yourself who you are? And how do you tell the world who you are? And how do how do we live in the world? You know, and that's a question that migrants have to answer from the moment of the from the moment of the act of migration. The book's quite funny uh, about your early attempts to become a published author, which were not initially very successful. Um, not at all. And you found your perfect little garret flat in uh, in West London, and and stuck at it. You had a job as a, an advertising copywriter part time to pay the rent, and one of the uh, was go to work on an egg yours. No, go to work on an egg was Faye Weldon's. Okay, so your but, one was, and I saw this, I saw a version of this the other day. You, you wrote a, a very successful advertising line for the Aero chocolate bar, which yes. included the words like irresistible bubble. Yes, Adora bubble, yes. And you, uh, Adora bubble, yeah. And, and, but you, you resisted their attempts to offer you, well, they tried to, they, they tried to lure you to, to work for them full time by offering you large salaries, but you, yeah. you stuck with the dream of becoming a fiction writer. Well, it, you know, it must have taken quite a bit of self-belief to, to stick with it. Were you ever tempted to, did you come close to giving it, giving it up? Yeah, I mean, I did, because, you know, I, I, I didn't have one of those starts that, that a number of my contemporaries had. You know, if you look at the early careers of people like, you know, Ian McEwan and Martin Amos and so on, they, you know, they they took off like a rocket. I mean, they 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 were in their early twenties. They had already established who they were as writers, you know, and and that that didn't happen to me. I mean, by the time Midnight's Children came out, I was getting on for thirty four years old. You know, so. Uh, and I left university at 21. So, it, it, so there's like 13 years in there where I was watching everybody of my age going off like a rocket all around me, you know, and, um, and wondering if that would ever happen, you know? And, and yes, I was tempted, but I'm actually, if I look back, I'm quite proud of that young person to, to stick at it. You know? um, I do think that Midnight Children was kind of Hollywood or bust. I mean, I remember, I remember when I finished it, thinking that as far as I could tell, this was a good book. But if, but if nobody agreed, then maybe I should just write the advertising copy. You know? Let me ask and you. But let me let me ask you to describe how Midnight's Children came about, because you you had a previous published novel, which you say in the book has quite rightly fallen into obscurity, uh, yeah. but you got a seven hundred pound advance for it, and you used yeah. that seven hundred pounds to go to India and travel around India cheaply, and you were there for months. months. And you describe it as a second healing, the first healing being Cambridge after your experience of racism at your secondary school. Mm. Cambridge was the, the, the opposite. Yeah. Cambridge was a great healing experience and introduced you to a different kind of England. And in what sense was going to India uh, in your late 20s uh, a healing experience? Well, it was just the business of reclaiming it for myself, you know. Uh, I mean, having at that point spent, you know, five years at rugby school and three years at Cambridge, we had me really away from India, apart from occasional visits, having been away for eight years, um, I feared that I was losing uh, my connection to it, you know, and, and, uh, 
I didn't want to, you know. And so, yeah, 700 pounds in 1973 was worth a lot more than 700 pounds is now. You, know, I, you could certainly, I think, put a zero on that. Um, and I just took the whole thing and went to India and traveled as cheaply as I could for as long as I could, both to places that I had known very well, like, like Bombay, where I grew up, and um, still Bombay at that time, uh, not Mumbai. And I, and I already had in my mind the idea of writing some kind of uh, panoramic Indian novel. And so, so I went to places that I knew I would want to write about, and I went to some places that I'd never been that I thought I might want to write about, you know, like, like Benares, for example, um, uh, and uh, which did in the end find its way into the novel. Um, and yeah, I came back from that experience and started writing. And it took you five years to write Midnight's Children. Yeah. And it made you a, an overnight superstar. It won the Booker Prize and it made you a household name in literary, in the English speaking world, in, in literary circles. And, um, but I, sometimes the book reads like a dialogue between you, age 73, and the, your younger self. And I was remembering today that Norman Mailer wrote an introduction for a 50th anniversary edition of The Naked and the Dead, in which he said, you know, I'm still proud of it. I was 24 when I wrote it, but when I read it now, 50 years on, in my 70s, it reads like the prose of a much younger and unfinished uh, writer. He said, for example, there's scarcely a, scarcely a noun that's not holding hands with the nearest available adject adjective. And I wonder when you look at Midnight's Children now, what you think of it? Well, first of all, that's probably the only example on record of startling modesty from Norman Mailer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, of course, I, when I when I look back at it, I think I don't write like that now, you know. Um, and and there are bits of it which surprise me into you know into happiness because I, because I think they are good. And there are other bits where I think, well, you know, maybe I wouldn't do that now. Um, but I think one of the absolute errors is to think that you can ever revisit an old book and improve it. You know, I think uh, there's a wonderful line that I've always liked by the American literary critic, Randall Jarrell, who says a novel is a long piece of writing that has something wrong with it. And, and I think that's true in the sense that Perfection is impossible. You know, you, you, if you write what that book is almost a quarter of a million words long, you know, and if you write anything of that length, perfection is a pipe dream. You, it just, it, it never happens. And I mean, you, what you do is you try and get as close to it as you can, but you accept the fact that there will be things which are less than perfect about it. You know, and I think that's true of everything that everybody writes. You know, so. Uh, there have been one or two people who've had a go at improving old books. I remember John Fowles had a go at revising The Makers. And, I mean, it didn't make that big of an impression on anybody. You know, it didn't, didn't really seem to be a big improvement. Um, who was it? Auden rewrote a poem or two of his and almost always made them worse. Um, so I think, yeah, you just have to, I mean, my view is you have to leave it alone because when you write a book, when I write a book anyway, an enormous amount of it is held in my head. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many pages of notes or files I've got. A lot of the, you know, the kind of spider's web of the book of how everything connects to everything else is just in here, you know, and, and, and remains there all the time that you're working on the book. But, at a certain point when you finish the book, it goes, you know, it's not there anymore. It has, and it has to go in order to make room for the next thing. Um, after that, if you try and go and go into the book, it, that it's, that it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's like performing brain surgery blindfolded. You know, you, can, you, you can't do it, can't do it and mustn't do it. I want to ask you about your friend, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Um, he wasn't a particularly close friend when the beginning of the darkest part of your life, the most difficult part of your life started. Mm. But he became a close friend during that period. Yes. The way he responded to your predicament 30 years ago was different to the way many of his friends on the left 
behaved. What was it about the way Christopher Hitchens responded to that episode that made you write about him the way you write about him? Well, you know, Christopher, Christopher was, never did things by halves. You know, I mean, he was not a kind of on the one hand, on the other hand kind of person. Um, he decided what he thought and he went for it 200%, you know, and, and um, that was his nature in all things. You know? uh, and and in, in this case, I mean, actually we separately without conferring said almost exactly the same thing about what happened to the satanic verses where he said that he found that everything in his life that he admired and revered was on one side and everything that he detested and loathed was on the other side. Um, and so it was easy for him to see which side he should be on. And I must say, I felt more or less the same. Um, he made himself closer to me in order to be more helpful. You know? and, and I mean, there's just one moment, at the moment at which the British government finally decided it might be a good idea for me to meet with the president of the United States and, 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 and that was Bill Clinton and, and, um, and helped partly helped to set it up, but one of the people who really helped to set it up was Christopher Hitchens because he was very friendly with some of Clinton's closest aides, um, notably George Stephanopoulos. And, um, and he persuaded George to persuade Clinton to do the right thing. And, and, and that did, that it, then that happened. And, and actually, when I was in the White House having the meeting with the president, Stephanopoulos, called Christopher and said, the eagle has landed. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I was, when I was reading that, um, your account of your relationship with Christopher Hitchens, uh, and, and you say that your predicament, I'll quote, made, him, made Christopher understand that a new danger had been unleashed upon the earth, a new totalizing ideology to step into the down at heel shoes of Soviet communism. I think the rest of us in the early 90s were still living with the, what you might call the Fukuyama delusion, that liberal democracy had won, it was the end of history, liberal democracy would now become the default position of all humankind. You were living the future. You were living our future at that time, in a sense, uh, because you could see very starkly, because it constrained you in a very dangerous way, um, that there were real dangers out there that were not going to be susceptible to liberalization. And the rest of us caught up with that many years later. Yeah, I, mean, I think actually it's just that people weren't paying attention because it was there to see. You know, I, I, the, I mean, the thing that happened to me was not by any means the first thing of that kind that happened. You know, there had been similar attacks on, on writers and intellectuals and, um, you know, dissenters across the Islamic world for a long time before that. You know, and and, the, and the, the, the Islamic revolution itself had been, um, you know, to say the least, brutal. Uh, so, so if one was looking in the right direction, one could have seen it coming. You know? And, and um, it's just that people were not looking in that direction. You know? And, and uh, in the same ways, I think we could have seen the current rise of, of um, a kind of anti-intellectual populism. Um, uh, we could have seen that coming. We uh, could have, but we didn't. And you write about Philip Roth, actually, in his book, The War Against America, in which he, um, he writes about it. It's a kind of alternative history in which Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, becomes president. He defeats President Roosevelt. America stays out of the Second World War, turns in on itself, and Charles Lindbergh becomes this populist leader. With the, he was the first to use the slogan, America first. And so there were clear, but this was a long, long time before, this is about 12, 14 years ago that Philip Roth published that book. And you said that when you read it, although you admired the book, you thought, nah, it's far-fetched, it can't happen here. So even you didn't see it coming. No, no, I, I, I thought, no, Philip, you, you know, that I don't buy it. You know, um, uh, not possible to happen in America. Um, and, and, you know, he was right and I was wrong. Um, it, it obviously, I mean, there's even before Philip Roth, there's uh, Sinclair Lewis, is it? His book called It Happened Here. Um, so there have been attempts, imaginative attempts, to imagine the destruction of American democracy. You know, but we don't have to imagine it anymore. 
I want to ask you a related question before I throw it open to the floor and to the online audience, uh, and it's connected to what's happened in America, and it's not directly about the book, it's about events this week. This is, seems to many of us a very momentous, even pivotal week with what has happened in Afghanistan. What do you make of that? Uh, I mean, I, the words fail me, really. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an appalling event. Um, I understand a political argument which says we've spent trillions of dollars, we can't go on running this other country forever. Uh, but the catastrophe that will now unfold which was entirely predictable, um, is a moral fault which will haunt, I think, I mean, somebody I admire, which is the, Joe Biden. Um, and, and, you know, since I think it's 57 years, the Americans have had close to 30,000 troops in South Korea, uh, presumably to protect it against communism. Uh, the, uh, the various groups that have been surveying the Afghan situation have said, roughly speaking, that four and a half thousand American troops remaining in, in Afghanistan would have been sufficient to stabilize the country and to prevent this calamity from happening. So I need somebody to answer that question. Why is it okay to put 28,000 people into South Korea for half a century without anybody ever saying, what are they doing there? We've, we've lived our lives uh, in the post-1945 architecture mm -hmm. of the rules-based liberal order underpinned by American power. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's coming to an end? I think it has come to an end, yes. I mean, I think whatever what used to be called the Pax Americana, you know, it, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I think uh, America doesn't want it. America doesn't want to be the world's policeman anymore um, and uh, hasn't been very good at it when it's tried. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people said about the 20th century that it was the American century. Um, well, the 21st certainly is not. We've got uh, a quarter of an hour left, so I want to open it up to the audience. If you, if, if the audience here in the, in the room, if you can raise your hand if you have a question. But, and there's a lady there on the end, about four rows. But I'm going to take an audience uh, a question, first of all, from you uh, at home. Uh, <laughs> what was your biggest achievement during lockdown? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think, like many of us, I, I would consider my biggest achievement to be getting through it. You know, uh, I think all of us who have had this experience and feel that here we still are, are feeling profoundly grateful to be here, you know, and, and that's what I think. I mean, I think uh, I managed to do a bit of writing, but, you know, that feels lesser. Yes. Would you like to take your mask off? Because we'll hear you a bit, bit, bit better. Ah. Uh, I wondered you spoke about not being able to write and be creative early on in the pandemic and it made me think um, maybe that's a necessary part of the process and that you need to pause to reflect to assimilate before you before you respond do you think that that lack of reflection is part of a bigger problem in society today that people don't pause to reflect well i think you might you know, I think you might have hit on something there. Um, yeah. Um, I do certainly, I felt that when such an, an event of such a colossal scale takes place, that we can't leap to judgment, you know, that we, we really need to listen instead of shooting our mouths off. We need to try and understand what's happening and why it's happened before we take up attitudes, you know, and, and, and I'm afraid I, what happened in many cases is that the people took up attitudes which were based on their previously existing prejudices, um, rather than in actually trying to understand the thing that was happening, which is why, for example, 
I think perhaps less so in the UK, but certainly in, in America, the enormous number of attacks on, on people of uh, Asian origin, um, who were, because of course, Trump was calling it the Chinese flu. And, and, and uh, at one point, I think the Kung flu. Um, and um, that made targets out of everybody uh, from that part of the world who who were living or whose whose parents came to live in America. Um, that was old-fashioned bigotry applying itself without much thought to, to a new situation. And I'm afraid there has been a lot of that. Again, raise your hand if, if you have a question and we'll come to you. Yes, there's one there. But I'm going to take this from... Uh, uh, somebody in the online audience. Do you think that the capacity for wonder and magical imagination may become difficult to gain for a generation growing up amidst unprecedented tragedy and trauma? Um, now, you're quite, you're quite scathing, disparaging in the book about uh, so-called realist uh, fiction, fiction of the, what you call the Elena Ferrante type, where uh, they want the, their, their fictional um, worlds to be as close as possible to the worlds they actually, actually live. You believe in the fantastical and the magic, but do you think it's do you think it's as possible for the a, a young writer come starting out now as it was for you forty years ago? Well, I mean, first of all, I, actually, I think Elena Ferrante is a wonderful writer. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want to, it to be thought that I was dissing Elena Ferrante, and and actually, I began to think more highly of her when there was this expose done, and it turned out that her real life was not very much like the lives of the people she was describing. And so it made me think it's an even better act of imagination than I had originally thought. But, well, what I find is that a lot of, if we're looking at younger writers, uh, younger writers who are not, how can I put this, white, uh, are still very interested in, in not accepting reality as given to them and therefore reimagining. So if you, if you, I mean, I noticed that in one of the writers featured in the little montage at the beginning uh, was, was the African-American writer Colson Whitehead. And, and, and Colson's novel, The Underground Railroad, which uses the idea that the Underground Railroad, instead of being like an escape network, might have actually been an Underground Railroad. Um, is, he's using, if you like, the, those techniques of surrealism whatever you want to call it, surrealism, fabulism, magic realism, as a way of saying the world is not what we are told it is, it is something else. You know? um, and I think a lot of writers of different ethnic groups and so on still feel that they need to question the reality that is given by society. And they do that by questioning, by using forms which are not openly realist, naturalist, Let's take a question here. Yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, sir, I was wondering, in your book, you say that Midnight's Children took you so long to finish because at the same time you were teaching yourself to write. Uh, I was wondering if you could go into a bit more detail about that process. Did that come from reading? Uh, what kind of line did you take with yourself there? And also, did you reach a point um, where you thought, I don't need to teach myself anymore. I'm great. Um, <laughs> how did that point come about? Great question. Terrific question. Well, some of all of that is the answer. I mean, I obviously read a lot, and the book, I think, can show it bears the marks of the of of the books from which it from which it well, which helped it come into being. Um, when I started writing it, I thought. I'm gonna write a story about childhood. I'm gonna write a story about childhood that is gonna use my childhood as a starting point. And, and what I found was that when I started writing it and the family in the book was originally much more like my family than, it, than in the book as published. And, and I found it just wasn't alive on the page. It was kind of inert. And so then I thought, okay, let me start making it not like my family. You know change things. And the more I changed, the more I made them not like my family, the more alive they became. And so that taught me something. That taught me something that about, about, it goes back to something we've been talking about, imagination. That when I was simply trying to make a portrait of real people, it, I wasn't doing it very well. Um, when I started making them up, I found that I was doing it much better. So that was a clue. 
And then I had this, this idea about having the child born at the same moment as the country. And that created a whole different book because then I had to tell the story of the country as well as the story of the child. So it became scarier and scarier as it went along. But yeah, I think by the time I finished it, I thought it was okay. But as I said before, I was absolutely not clear that anybody would agree with that. And, and um, the thing that completely came out of nowhere was the, uh, this idea that it would become this colossal global bestseller. Which is, I, I thought if it gets a good publisher and it's read a few, few thousand people who are not personally known to me or related to me by blood or marriage, that would be fine. So what happened to it was something I could literally never have dreamed of. I'm going to take a question from online. Is truth under assault because the American press, in large part, treats US politics as a horse race where both sides are weighed equally and the press has a stake in avoiding establishing facts, inspired by their reticence, perhaps, to losing access to elites? You're actually very complimentary about the role of American newspaper journalists in, in uh, particular in your book, Salman. Well, in the, in the, during the Trump administration, uh, the the, the Journalism was under a kind of assault that I've never seen before in a democratic society. Uh, and to have the press referred to routinely as the enemy of the people, uh, which is a Stalinist mind, uh, was, was shocking. And I thought a number of newspapers did really very, very well to try and continue to, to bring the news. But I do think, I mean, in that question somewhere, there's this question of, uh, of of balance, so the idea that every issue has two sides and that both sides must be presented with equal weight. Uh, and I think one of the things we're learning, especially right now, where one side of the argument is com composed more or less entirely of untruth uh, and the other side of truth, that there are sometimes not two sides to a question. You know, um, and. I mean, the BBC labors under this problem too, that you know, you're supposed to have this idea, this Rethian idea of balance. So if you say on the one hand, you have to say on the other hand. Um, sometimes there isn't on the other hand. Um, you, you worry if, you know, does that mean that we would have to give Nazis equal time with anti-Nazis? Yeah. The, the, I face this in my own working life, Solomon. The, the analogy I always make is if somebody's arguing 2 plus 2 equals 4 and somebody else is arguing with equal conviction and passion that 2 plus 2 equals 6, it's never right to say the truth lies somewhere in between. It's That's easy, but your job is to assess the quality of evidence upon which an assertion is based and then make a judgment. Yes, we've got a question up here. Hi, Simon. You spoke early in the interview about your, uh, your appreciation of literary translators. As a multilingual author, what are the joys of and the frustrations of translation? Well, as I say, if I, if I didn't have the benefit of work in translation, there's 90% of the books that I love I would never have been able to read. Um, so, um, I mean, I remember when I was in New York for the, for, at the very beginning of my career, going to the offices of my then publisher Bob Gottlieb at Alfred Knopf, and he pulled off his bookshelf a book by a Japanese writer who I'd never read called Junichiro Tanizaki. And he said, I see it as my job in, as a publisher to keep this book in print. And he said, you should read it because it's better than Anna Karenina. And I thought, oh yeah, sure it is, of course it is. And I, it's a book called The Makioka Sisters. And I took it home and I started reading it and I thought, you know what? It's better than Anna Karenina. And again, I would never have known about Tanizaki uh, or never been able to read his work had it not been for translation. Now, in terms of translating my own books, I sometimes feel kind of sorry for my translators because these are not the easiest books in the world to translate. Um, and so I'm, I'm much in awe of them. And I have to say, nobody ever reads your work as carefully as your translator does. So I've had one or two kind of embarrassing moments. I, you, I remember, I think, maybe my Danish translator. Uh, they're very polite, you see, in, in Denmark. So, uh, uh, he said something like, you see, in your novel, he said on page 322, such and such character says this. And as, of course, you know, in your earlier novel, so-and-so, on page 186, 
this completely different character said the same thing. Mm. And I just was interested to know why you wanted to make this intertextual connection between the books. And then you have to pretend you did it on purpose. <laughs> There are many, many more questions, Salman, both from the floor here and online, but we're out of time. It's been a fascinating hour. I've enjoyed it hugely. Thanks again to the Royal Bank of Scotland for sponsoring the event. Don't forget, you can buy the book at the virtual bookshop if you're watching it online. Uh, click on the, on the bookshop uh, uh, icon, and you can buy the book if you're live here in Edinburgh uh, in the, the bookshop outside. And Salman, unfortunately, is not here to sign his books but he's here in spirit. I hope we get you back in the flesh soon, Salman. I've enjoyed this hour immensely. I hope you have. Thank you very much indeed.